These touch-me-not balsam have sprung up to cover the woodland floor. Each night, the leaves go limp as the balsam exudes any excess moisture. In the waterlogged soils of the Lake District, this is a handy adaptation. Soon their blooms unfurl. As the petals of these strange shaped flowers drop off, seed pods begin to form. These pods are the favourite food of the netted carpet moth caterpillar. Although it was once thought to be extinct, the netted carpet moth survives here in the Lake District, its last remaining stronghold. Touch Me Not Balsam is their only source of food. These plants have a surprise in store. Their seed heads explode. It's how they became known as touch me not. But nobody told the caterpillars this. The caterpillars have no warning when these little bombs go off. It's not just seeds that get hurled across the forest floor. The Namib Desert, one of the most exposed places on Earth. As the sun climbs high, everybody takes cover from the extreme heat. Everybody except the hot rod ant. As others take refuge, their day is just beginning. Cleaning out the nest. The sand can reach a scorching 70 centigrade. The ant's long legs raise their bodies above the surface where it's 10 degrees cooler. But if they stand still, they will fry. They must keep moving or risk the same fate as their quarry, the creatures that have collapsed from heat stroke. Too deeply buried, but a good place to cool off. Foraging decisions must be fast. Too big. Perfect. Back to the nest before they also die. But they've strayed into a minefield. Each of these strange, cone-shaped pits is a death trap. With a brutal predator, 
at its center. Here lie antlion larvae, tiny ambush predators with venom-filled pincers.
seeking out the signs of anything alive. They spread out along a 10 meter front, sweeping across the forest floor. To find prey, the ants must first touch it. The irony is that this, the most successful hide and seek player in the forest, is almost completely blind. It distinguishes the living only by their movement. As long as an animal remains still, it is safe. But the slightest twitch will give it away. Within seconds, the prey is pinned down. Within minutes, it's torn apart at its joints. The more the prey struggles, the more the ants engage. Right across the raid front, prey of all sizes are driven from their hiding places. Even wasps must abandon their homes when the ants arrive. Everything alive in the path of the raiders, overwhelmed by sheer numbers. To survive here, you have to be prepared to die here. But the sun can return as quickly as the storm arrived. And a rise of just a few degrees is enough to spark a thaw, even underground. Frozen solid, a mountain stone wetter. It has the most extraordinary survival technique of all. The ability to come back from the dead. Only in a specialized filming chamber can we capture its extraordinary talent. The wetter has developed special proteins which prevent ice crystals from forming inside its cells. A remarkable trick for a creature whose ancestors once lived in prehistoric warm wet forests. But when New Zealand's mountains grew up beneath them around five million years ago, they were forced to come up with this incredible ability to survive near lethal temperatures. Defrosting uses up a lot of energy. So mountain snowberries are a welcome sight. The wetter needs to stock up while it can. The next Antarctic storm could be the return of winter.
It can tolerate over 80% of its body freezing solid and can do so day in and day out for weeks at a time. Nowhere else in New Zealand does life go to such extremes to survive. Back in the hive, those bees too young to forage are housekeeping. Like the hornet queen, the queen bee has the immeasurable task of laying enough eggs to ensure the health and future of the colony. The custom of keeping wild Japanese bees is as old as society itself, and Yamaguchi has kept bees since boyhood. Japanese bees are so sensitive that it takes great patience and skill to keep them. The art of keeping them lies in understanding their behavior. They make honey stores for the winter but they also produce enough for Yamaguchi to harvest. Japanese bees may produce less honey than European bees, but the taste is very special. It's the smell of this growing store of energy-rich honey which could be their downfall, if it draws in a hornet scout. But right now, the hornets have other problems to contend with. The nest is now monstrous. The workers have excavated over a ton of earth. There are so many bodies living at close quarters that the queen and her dynasty are in danger of overheating. So workers create air conditioning, keeping a steady flow of fresh air circulating. Being unable to cope with high temperatures is a giant hornet's Achilles heel. The warmth of the hornet's nest belies the change in season. Seasons change fast up here in the mountains, and when autumn arrives, there are far fewer insects around. This means my hives are even more vulnerable to attack. For me, it's an anxious time. In the search for autumnal food, a scout hornet discovers Yamaguchi's wild bees. The honeybees fan an alarm pheromone through the air. This alerts the whole hive to the hornet's presence. The scout smells the honey within. A prize this rich is worth scent marking. But unlike the European bees, these Japanese bees do not attack. Instead, they lure the scout inside. Still, the bees hang fire. Then, one is caught. It's the signal the others have been waiting for. Surrounded by vibrating bodies, the hornet at the core of the bee ball begins to overheat. The bees have the advantage, a heat tolerance two degrees above that of their enemy. 
At 46 degrees Celsius, the aggressor is roasted alive. The wild bees have spent millions of years living with the enemy. That's why they alone have developed this extraordinary survival strategy. He starts his search. A female is likely to be on a tree trunk. But trees in this part of the world are very tall. His search could be a long one. Unfortunately for him, she is 25 meters above him, near the top. She has more normal sized jaws, but then she only needs them for feeding. But he needs immense jaws for fighting because there are other males around with the same mission. Sheer strength is not enough in these battles. The technique is to reach over your opponent's head and hook your jaws under his wing covers. That's why his jaws are so long and have that odd shape. He's got the grip. Now he has to lift. And that needs strength. Another lift is needed. That's that. Beetle armor is strong, so he bounces. The winner climbs on. There are more males ready to fight him up here. at last. But she doesn't seem to be in the mood. So now he has to use his great jaws as a restraining cage. Success at last. But the hurling habit dies hard. Mantids will eat anything that moves, including other mantids. This tiny insect is now open to attack 
from predators lurking in the undergrowth. Whether an individual mantis survives or not is partly a matter of chance. Whether it's spotted by a predator. Whether it turns right or left. So far, its luck has held. But this hungry jumping spider is still in pursuit. A mantis is born with exceptional eyesight. But the spider's is even better. Although this young mantis can't yet fly, its long forelegs, evolved to catch prey, give it reach. seems to be no escape. But this mantis has a surprising line in self-defense. Kung Fu, praying mantis style. Of course, it's all bluff, trying to look bigger and confuse its enemy. But it's got away with it. Just staying alive for its first few hours is a significant accomplishment for a newly hatched insect. But there's still a long way to go. With a bit of luck, in two months' time, it will be as big and beautiful as this orchid mounted. Or maybe not. After all, mantids are cannibals. By pooling their resources, the queens have survived their first major challenge. But this coalition can't last. Tensions are already on the rise as the queens jostle for position within the royal court. The weaker crouch submissively before the more dominant, including the founding queen. So begins the delicate manoeuvring that will soon take on a deadly significance. Those at the bottom of the hierarchy have little chance of surviving the coming trials. Another struggle for control is also beginning above ground. The Corral Nest is not the only one in Horseshoe Canyon. The desert floor is littered with similar sized colonies and there's not enough room for all of them. Now the darker side of the honey ants emerges. It's time for the corral colony to mount a preemptive strike on its nearest neighbors. This killing spree continues through the summer until the corral colony has eliminated all the other new nests in their immediate neighborhood.
the foundations of the Empire have been laid. Underground too, events have taken a darker turn. One of the Queens lies dead in the Royal Chamber. It's not clear why, but the workers have started singling out the weaker Queens for special attention. At first it's all very subtle. One isn't fed so often or cleaned as diligently. But then the workers start bullying and harassing their chosen victim. Finally, it spills over into direct attack and the workers tear the chosen queen to pieces. Nothing can go to waste, even a royal carcass. Workers carry hungry larvae over to feast on the dead queen, including many that must have been her own offspring. As the weeks pass, the revolution continues. Only the most dominant royals seem immune to attack. They just watch and wait as the workers go about their gruesome business. When the air itself becomes saturated and the temperature is just right, rare giants emerge. A Powellophanta snail. It can grow to the size of a man's fist. So rare, they can only be filmed in captivity, where their extraordinary behavior is revealed. It's still a mystery as to exactly how they track down their food. But one thing is for sure. This snail has unusual tastes and revolting table manners. envelops and suffocates the earthworm. It sucked down like spaghetti. For anything bigger, it's got 6,000 teeth ready to shred the next meal. In this super saturated environment, this specialized snail is the ultimate predator. Marines have arrived in the mountains of East Africa. One of the most organized swarms on Earth has appeared above ground. They are driver ants, an insect with a fearsome reputation. In 
In the rainy season, they form these extraordinary hunting trails. Large soldier ants line the trail, protecting the smaller workers inside. Their massive jaws create an impregnable barricade. The soldiers create these protective tunnels whenever they cross open ground. The trails radiate from the nest in every direction. Some stretch 100 metres. A worker running at full pelt takes 45 minutes to run its length. The soldiers protect the trail at any cost. Although blind, they are highly sensitive to vibrations and air currents and become instantly defensive when under attack. Stress pheromones put the whole task force on alert. They are ready to take on anything, including people. They are programmed to keep the trail moving or die trying. Driver ants are the stuff of legend. It is said that they kill everything that crosses their path. It is said that no animal is safe when they're on the warpath. It is even said that they will enter huts to attack people or kill babies left unattended in their cots. The truth is somewhat different. Although the bites are painful against people, they are purely defensive. The jaws may slice through human flesh like butter, but it's simply a warning. Despite the myths, driver ants are still ruthless killers, but in a way that often benefits the villagers. Dangerous pests like scorpions are quickly set upon by the ants. Even the scorpion's deadly sting is powerless against this invincible army. Both workers and soldiers join the attack, dividing up their roles according to their size. As some look for a chink in its leg armour, others prize open its body plates like a tin opener. With its sting immobilised and faced by such overwhelming odds, the scorpion eventually gives up the fight. The dismembered body is hauled back down the trail to feed the nest. The farmer's fields provide even more opportunities for the attack force. Pests disturbed by digging are soon dispatched by hundreds of razor-sharp jaws. The ants make a clean sweep, capturing up to 100,000 insects in a single raid. Despite the ants' formidable reputation, most farmers value their role as pest controllers. In defence of the trail, the ants take no prisoners, but even an innocuous-looking insect can be surprisingly dangerous. The soil millipede is killed quickly, but the soldier's highly sensitive antennae immediately reveal that it's poisonous. The message soon reaches nearby ants. They know exactly what to do. They gather lumps of mud and bury the problem. With the millipede out of harm's way, the trail can safely continue its journey. But more dangers await the trailblazers.
a praying mantis plucks unsuspecting ants from the column. He seems to have the upper hand, but the ants he kills send out a dying message. Reacting to this pheromone, reinforcements arrive. The mantis is a deadly predator, but the ants know exactly what they're dealing with. One soldier grabs the mantis's jaws, stopping it from doing any more damage. Other ants swarm over the mantis, butchering it with surgical precision. The mantis's fate is sealed by a clinical decapitation. The eggs and pupae are taken into the new nest. Here, they are safe. The millions of interlocking ants that make up the nest superstructure create an impenetrable barrier. from the outside is it possible to get an idea of the nest's huge scale. Literally millions of individuals form a nervous network that communicates using pheromones. As ants pass messages to each other, they effectively act like brain cells. Through the millions of interconnections, they arrive at a decision that works for the benefit of the colony. Like human brain cells, individual ants are not intelligent, but the links between them create a mind, an ant superbrain. Deep inside is the queen. Her role is to replenish the colony by laying two million eggs a month. She is merely an egg-laying machine under the collective command of all the ants that make up the mind of the hive. The ants create a different kind of intelligence, a brain that exists outside any single body. There is no other species on the planet that responds as quickly and as dramatically to the good times as the desert locust. Eggs that have remained in the ground for 20 years begin to hatch. The young locusts are known as hoppers, for at this stage they're flightless. They find new feeding grounds by following the smell of sprouting grass. Normally, it takes four weeks for hoppers to become adults. But when the conditions are right, as now, their development switches to the fast track. As the vegetation in one place begins to run out, the winged adults release pheromones, scent messages, which tell others in the group that they must move on.
and when groups merge, they form a swarm. locus eats its entire body weight every day and a whole swarm can consume literally hundreds of tons of vegetation. They have to keep on moving. The swarm travels with the wind. It's the most energy saving way of flying. Following the flow of wind means that they're always heading toward areas of low pressure places where wind meets rain and vegetation starts to grow. As they fly, swarms join up with other swarms to form gigantic plagues several billion strong and as much as 40 miles wide. They will consume every edible thing that lies in their path. This is one of planet Earth's greatest spectacles. It's rarely seen on this scale, and it won't last long. Once the food has gone, the steady roar of a billion beating locust wings will once again be replaced by nothing more than the sound of the desert wind. We've seen how managing woodland and farmland for butterflies can preserve the countryside we love and also how butterflies can inspire the next generation to protect it. But if you still have doubts about whether butterflies can make our countryside a better place, then you need look no further than the humble caterpillar. Because if there's one thing we've learned from them, it's that change is possible. This is a brimstone. It emerged from an egg a few weeks ago, but now it's ready for a change. First, it spins a silken pad, a place to anchor hooks on the rear of its body. In a move to rival a contortionist, it passes strands of silk behind itself creating a girdle to support it through the change to come. With anchor and line secure, the transformation can take place. Caterpillars are little more than stomachs on legs. But that body has served its purpose and can be discarded in favour of another. The caterpillar's head is about to split wide open and when it does, something very different will emerge. A chrysalis. The caterpillar was an eating machine, an identity rolled up like a sock and discarded. This body is for something different, an agent of near miraculous change and one responsible for making butterflies powerful symbols of hope and transformation. This is a sign that something beautiful is surely on its way. The chrysalis is one of the most enduring symbols in the natural world. 